Hello and welcome to the Anita Po Show, the best Bitcoin podcast in town. My guest today is Christian Decker. He's a researcher and developer at Blockstream. We're going to talk about the Lightning Network, their new project called Greenlight, and I'll ask him about Blockstream's plans for the future. Before that, a short word about my new book and a message from my sponsors. Enjoy. Did you know that last year more than 14 million trades were made with gift cards on Paxful? That's 14 million discounts that were given in exchange for Bitcoin through regular entrepreneurs like you and me. Through these trades, entrepreneurs can make a profit. At the same time, they help unbanked people around the globe send money back home or access the global economy. An international business with Bitcoin is possible for everyone, and Paxful truly believes it. Find out how entrepreneurs around the world have been changing their lives with Bitcoin and Paxful.com by checking out this link, anita.link slash Paxful. That's anita.link slash Paxful. Learn Bitcoin will teach you the why and how to use Bitcoin. It's no simple task to explain Bitcoin. Anita's angle of attack is holistic, synthetic, and clear. Thomas Votlin, founder and CEO Electrum. Order your copy now at learnbitcoin.link. That's learnbitcoin.link. Living on crypto is easier than you think with Bitrefill. Choose from over 4,000 gift cards and mobile top-up options from around the world. I used Bitrefill to top up my phone when I was visiting Zimbabwe. It was easy, worked like a charm, and I even earned sats back. Pay with Bitcoin, Lightning, Ethereum, Dash, Tether over Tron, and many more options. No account is necessary. Join the thousands of users around the world who are living on crypto today using Bitrefill. Join now at bitrefill.com and start earning sets back with each purchase. That's bitrefill.com. Hello, Christian. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Glad to be here. It's great to have you on again. We met 2019, I think, um, and did a German interview, but it's the first time uh, in English. Oh, that's, that's been forever ago. <laughs> yeah, that's true. In, in Bitcoin times, that's really forever. Um, so, as always, I would like to start with a little introduction. Uh, so, please introduce yourself to our listeners. Who are you? What are you doing? And um, then I'm going to ask you a little bit about your background. I mean, when you came into the Bitcoin space and things like that. Yes, yeah, so I'm uh, Chris. I am a, a software engineer at Blockstream and I work on the Lightning Network. And I've been in the space like forever. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've seen it all. <laughs> yeah, I uh, also I've seen something. I was on your blog on your website and um, the first post uh, when you were writing about Bitcoin was called Bitcoin is getting some traction and that was in December 2010. Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, you, you're really a long time Bitcoiner. How was it to be a part of this movement in the last 11 years and how have things changed for you? Uh, it's, uh, it's been an amazing journey. Uh, I would have never guessed that I'd be sticking, uh, sticking up with it for this long. Um, back when, uh, when I stumbled over this unconspicuous paper uh, in 2009, while doing my master's, um, it just happened to, to mesh with my personal interests. Um, and later when I, when I had to decide on, on what to do to do my doctoral thesis, um, well, I hadn't, didn't have to look too far. Um, and all the way it's been, uh, it's been a great community. Uh, things have changed over the time, obviously. Um, what started out as a really, really tiny and tight-knit community back in uh, 2011, we had the first meetup here in Zurich with four people. Uh, most of which I'm, I'm still in touch with. Um, and, uh, and now there it's this global phenomenon. And uh, yeah, it's, it's gotten so big and so sprawling that I had to turn off my Google alerts uh, for the term Bitcoin because I couldn't read anything, uh, all, uh, everything anymore. 
Um, so yeah, it's been quite an adventure. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I think you were the first person to write a doctoral thesis about Bitcoin, is that right? Yes, I uh, beat Andrew Miller by a couple of weeks. Uh, so globally, the first one. Yeah. yeah wow. And um, you're also, as a researcher, still, I guess, a lot uh, into the academic research on Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Um, can you tell me, are there, I mean, I think, has the number of papers of, uh, about Bitcoin grown uh, even in the last year or, or months? And do you also see papers on, about other cryptocurrencies? Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, this space has totally taken off. I'm, I'm still reviewing for a number of conferences, uh, doing the peer, -to -peer, uh, the peer reviews for, uh, for them. And uh, it's gotten so big that I can't even, I can't even count them anymore. Um, it used to be the case that I that I could that that I had an archive of uh, of all of these articles and was publishing uh, sort of all of the abstracts and links to the various papers. And nowadays, I just ca can't keep up anymore um, unless I were to restrict to a very very tiny set of uh, of topics. Um, and Usually the way it, it works in academia is uh, you, you try to do a greenfield uh, project and only then you port it back onto existing systems. Um, that's because it's much easier to build without any, uh, any limitations that, that existing systems might have. And, and only then you think about how to, how to make them work with the existing systems. And uh, that's that's the, uh, that means that we have a lot of proposals for new systems, but all the ones that will end up having success can be ported back to, to, to Bitcoin in this case. Um, so I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty confident that, that we can build a lot of cool stuff on Bitcoin still. Oh, wow. That would be interesting for another podcast. Like what, what are the papers you are looking uh, into and, and what do you think are the, the upcoming big uh, uh, new features and innovations? Um, so and now comparing the last Bitcoin bull run, let's say it in 2016, 27 to this one. Um, do you also feel that there's a difference? Um. To be perfectly honest, I don't follow price trends that much and therefore I'm not aware of there being or not being a bull run. Um, so uh, it's, it's gotten, uh, when, when, when you talk about, about uh, uh, technology with people, you notice that, that people, are, people are much more uh, sort of uh, confident in the future of, uh, of Bitcoin. And, uh, and in its ability to recover from whatever we throw at it. Um, a couple of years ago, it, it was this, this kind of craze and, and, and panic almost that, uh, that people were, oh, what, what's the next Bitcoin? And, and oh, can, can we keep up? And should I sell now? And, um, and, and nowadays, it, it just, uh, you, you basically just shrug anything off. And, uh, uh, and so, so that's, that's what I noticed. Uh, uh, coming over the last uh, last couple of years, um, but I'm definitely not a trader. I'm I usually start conferences by telling people that I'm the idiot who sold 100 bitcoins for five bucks, and that <laughs> that will result in them not asking about my my uh, economic uh, um, future, basically. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's only a distraction. And I guess you're not very often on Twitter or on other news portals so, uh, and concentrate on research and, and developing stuff. And that's also a great thing because we need people who, who, who really work on that stuff and not only talk about, uh, about it. Oh, I'm, I'm a lot on Twitter. It's just that I don't, uh, I, I, I seem to not follow the people that, that talk price only. Um, ah, interesting. So, yeah. So, so maybe I should look if you have a list uh, that I can follow too <laughs> of these people. <laughs> so um, Christian, now let's talk about the growth of the Lightning Network because I think you were one of the uh, people who shaped or, or were a part of the first developments in the Lightning Network. So. Um, I can remember in 2017 when we had the block size debate, which was settled through the hard fork 
um, many people then expressed their concerns that the Lightning Network is much too complicated, it will never work and such. I hear that less and less now. Um, but many people uh, in, in mainstream still don't know yeah. what the Lightning Network actually is. Maybe can you just explain it in simple words um, so that we have an intro to the Lightning Network? Yeah, um, it, uh, it is basically a system that allows us to compress many, many, many transactions into, into a very tiny footprint on the blockchain itself um, by basically creating a, um, a, a system of smart contracts that uh, that are managed by a uh, by basically two endpoints. Um, so what what I usually do is uh, I take out the example of a poker table. Um, the two of us sit down at a poker table. We put some money on the table. Um, once it's on the table, neither of us can can actually grab it and run away. And uh, and then we start playing and we start playing rounds of, uh, rounds of poker and sometimes. Part, uh, some more of that money on the table uh, belongs to me, and sometimes I lose, and you be, uh, you own some uh, some more parts of uh, of that pot. And at the end of the uh, and at the end of the evening, we stand up and we grab the part that belongs to us. Always uh, checked by the other side that we we're, we're not sort of stealing uh, stealing their part of the money, and uh, and we leave. And um, the analogy here is that uh, we putting money on the table is basically a transaction uh, on the Bitcoin blockchain where we put uh, where we uh, send Bitcoins into a two of two multisig. The table here is a two of two multisig. When we have the money on the table, we both have to agree on how to split it and this agreement might change over time. And when we stand up and we, we actually want to get our money back, we, uh, we agree on how, to, uh, how we spend that money by creating a, uh, a transaction that takes the money out of the pot and splits it into uh, your share and my share. And that's another transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain. So what the Bitcoin blockchain sees is, uh, is basically the creation and the uh, and, and the settlement of uh, of this of this contract of this poker table, but what it doesn't see is all the hands we played in between. So we could have played millions of of poker hands in between, but the blockchain only cares about the creation and the settlement of uh, of the of the poker table basically. And by doing this, we can compress all of the all of the transactions we had in the meantime into just two transactions on the blockchain, making much, much better use on, of the very limited space that we have on the Bitcoin blockchain. And then there is constructions where we can extend this to, uh, to have multi-hop payments where I pay you and you pay the bar for me for my coffee, for example. Um, and yeah, so that's the basic functionality of, of most of these constructions. And in particular, this is the, the construction that we use for a Lightning Network. Mm -hmm. And it basically ma scales the Bitcoin, the possibilities to send more and faster transactions, let's say Bitcoin payments, Lightning payments, because we always hear this Bitcoin can only yeah. do seven transactions per second and Visa is much better. So, but in the end, I think with the Lightning Network, we can have even more uh, transactions per second than Visa has. Is this true? Absolutely. So, um, the, 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 the scale is one side of uh, one advantage that we have with the Lightning Network. Privacy and, and, uh, and basically immediacy of settlement is, is the, are the other ones. Um, but we can talk about those later. Um, Quantifying the, the scale that the Lightning Network can give us is, is really hard. Um, but the fact that we could potentially have, uh, have an infinite number of transactions uh, without ever touching the blockchain uh, makes, it, uh, makes it a really useful tool for us to extend uh, not, just, not just the reach of Bitcoin, because we now can process so many more transactions, but also opening up a number of new use cases. Um, if I go to my grocery store and I want to pay with Bitcoin, I, 
don't really want to stay there for an hour for my Bitcoin payment to be settled. Uh, when I can use Lightning, I can actually settle it in less than a second quite easily. Um, so just to throw some numbers out there, uh, we, have, we have seven transactions per second for, uh, for the Bitcoin blockchain. Each of these could be creating a Lightning channel. And each of these Lightning channels with today's software, with today's uh, unoptimized uh, implementations, we can easily reach 500 transactions per second per channel. Wow. Um, and, and so the, the network, I, I mean, that's, that's of course an, an upper limit at the moment, but uh, you, you can see where this is going. We can basically scale out by creating more channels. Um, and so with six channels, we could potentially overtake Visa. <laughs> cool. So, and I guess, is the number of nodes relevant to that? And is also the, the localization of the nodes, like the, the, the decentralization around the globe, is this a factor? Because, I mean, the, the number of Lightning nodes has grown immensely in the last months. Now, I think we have around 15,000 nodes worldwide. Um, is, I always ask myself, I mean, in Africa, for instance, there are only maybe 20 or 30, or I don't know how many, but much less than in, in the US and in Europe. Is this a problem for lightning payments in Africa that there are only uh, 20 nodes? I, I should probably mention that this 15,000 number is, uh, is always, talks always about the public part of the network. Um, the part that has opted into facilitating payments for others. Uh, by, by providing bridges between, between endpoints. And so um, the, the actual number of network participants and nodes might be much, much higher. And back in 2019, when we last, last met, uh, I, I had a slide basically showing that, uh, that about 40% of the network is part of this submerged part of the iceberg. Um, and so I don't have the current numbers, but uh, but I'd expect the number of uh, of sort of private participants that do not opt into uh, into into forwarding for other people uh, might be much much higher. Um, that aside, um, the number of uh, the number of nodes we have in the network represent the uh, the possible endpoints and origins for payments, and so every merchant and every Every user that, that wants to transfer a payment um, must operate one of these nodes. Basically, it's not like the, the Bitcoin network where uh, the yeah, where the participant uh, where the origin uh, where the senders of tra Bitcoin transactions can basically send it into the network without themselves being uh, being a node. So you have to be an active participant in the in the network, and so um, the the uh, yeah, the, 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 the number of nodes is definitely an indication for adoption in this case. Um, why, is, uh, uh, why is the number in Africa so much lower than, uh, than, than, every, uh, than elsewhere? Um, that is probably due to them mostly using, uh, uh, mostly using private wallets uh, that uh, might run on a mobile phone, might be offline for uh, for periods at a time, and therefore might not be well suited for forwarding other payments because these nodes have to be online while you perform a payment. Um, other options are that simply the the prospect of being a routing node is is much more uh, much more well known in 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 uh, in Western countries, Europe and and America in particular. So. Um, I, I expect these numbers to grow if they're not already uh, bigger than, than what we can actually measure and see right now. Mm -hmm. So now I've understood something new that, I mean, I run a full node, I run a Raspi Blitz at home. And, uh, but I also, of course, have uh, non-custodial Bitcoin wallets. And it never occurred to me that these are, yeah. full, no that these are full nodes, basically. But I don't route. I just uh, yes. receive and send my own uh, transactions, uh, payments. 
Ah, okay, yeah, interesting. Yeah, but then, of course, you're right. Then uh, there have to be much, much more nodes around already. Yeah, okay. Um, and also, um, I think now we have 2,300 Bitcoin inside the Lightning Network, which is immense. I mean, when did it start? In 2017, 18, you started to build the Lightning Network? Um, so the paper came out in 2015. Uh, and late 2015, Rusty decided, so my colleague in Australia, decided, uh, decided to join Blockstream and hoping to work on Bitcoin uh, and was told to instead work on this new crazy idea. And um, yeah, so, so 2015 he started and, uh, and shortly thereafter um, the, uh, the Lightning Labs team was, uh, was founded uh, with back then the uh, the authors of, of the of the lightning paper and uh, and the uh, and then uh, asank and, and Perry started and since then we we basically expanded this and i think in 2018 we opened the blockstream store shop which uh, was reckless as uh, <laughs> as we like to say in the space um, and we had the first sort of on chain uh, the, the the first uh, uh, Bitcoin mainnet transactions that were basically buying stickers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, cool. so yeah, it's it's basically been 2018 and and there uh, then on that uh, that the network has started to grow, but work has started much much earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, but that that means that from 2018 on, let's only three years. In three years, um, Bitcoin worth 100 million US dollar today uh, have flown into the Lightning Network. I mean, that's crazy, yeah? That's the visible part. We don't actually know how much is really in the network. True, wow. <laughs> um, and I think it's also important that you just mentioned uh, your colleague, Rusty Russell, and but that also there are other people, independent developers and other companies like Lightning Labs, Async and many more that you are developing and working together on the Lightning Network protocol. Yeah. Because there's always these, uh, this, this um, thing going on that Blockstream is controlling uh, Bitcoin in a way. Yeah? But I ask you about that <laughs> later. Let's go back to, the, to analyzing the Lightning Network. Do you have other metrics um, that people are not so much talking about that you use to evaluate the state of the Lightning Network? Um, certainly the, uh, the structure of the network is something very important uh, for us. Uh, unlike, uh, unlike Bitcoin, where basically every node is identical and, and talks uh, and, and shares transactions to update their local view of what is true, uh, in Lightning what we, what we have to do is we, uh, since we have these uh, relationships between two parties always, uh, we have to somehow find a way from, uh, from the sender to the recipient uh, to transfer money. Um, so like, like my example before, uh, if I want to pay somebody that I'm not directly connected to, then I have to find one peer, uh, a, a peer of mine that then has a peer of his and then has a peer of his ultimately connect to whoever I want to, uh, uh, want to pay. And so we, we do that by, hey, I give you one Bitcoin if you forward 0.99 Bitcoins to that guy and then he transfers 0.98 to that next one until we actually reach this, this person. If there is no such a path, uh, then we simply cannot transfer money. Uh, from me to whoever I want to pay, and so um, this is this is the topology of the network, the structure of the network, uh, where we uh, where we need to make sure that between any two endpoints there is actually a a direct or indirect connection through intermediaries um, that uh, with with enough capacity with enough funds in their channels such that we can actually reach them with the desired amount. Um, so that's that's definitely uh, an important metric. The more the denser the network, the more resilient it gets to uh, to single channels not being available or nodes going offline. And so the, the the denser we have the network, the more stable the network becomes, and the more options we have to reach our destinations. 
Uh, one thing that is often overlooked is that uh, we can split payments across, across multiple paths. And so um, the denser the network, the more diversity we have in, in, the, in these paths, the, the more private all, uh, our, our transfer is as well, because we are not telling, I'm not telling you, hey, my total amount is 10 Bitcoins. Uh, here, take 10. Um, but I'm telling you, oh, please transfer 0.5 Bitcoins to that guy and, uh, and I'll, be, I'll be arranging some other paths for, for the remainder. And so there's also a privacy argument there. Um, other metrics that, that we might be, uh, might be interested in is, is who owns what part of, of the money in, uh, in the channels. So in our poker table example, if you have, you have all the chips, then I mm -hmm. can't play anymore. Uh, I have to wait for you to lose some money to me before I can, I can uh, stake again, right? So um, if uh, these, these channels might not always work in both directions equally well, uh, because there might be an imbalance of, of, of the capacity. Um, other than that, I think there's very little we can actually see about the network. Um, I, I have this, this usual slide where I, where I explain the, the state of the network and, uh, and there's always the big numbers of this many nodes and this many channels. And then you come to, oh, number of transactions uh, performed, question mark. Um, because uh, unlike Bitcoin, where all of the transaction data is public and we can actually go through with a, with a, uh, with a bean counter and, and basically count how many transactions there were and how, what value was transferred, in Lightning, you don't see that. Uh, that, that, is, that is private information to the parties involved in, in the payment itself. And we can't really have this global, global data. Um, that is sad for me because I would like to be able to brag about huge numbers of transactions, but ultimately it's good for users because we don't have this permanent trace of them buying coffee somewhere, basically. Um, but still, I mean, is there not a chance for companies like Chainalysis or something to, to find out uh, payments? Because as soon as we like cash out or let's say go into the Bitcoin blockchain again, then there are transactions again. But I guess everything in between is unknown. So what, what they can see is basically the initial balance of how much, how much Bitcoins did we put into the channel to open the channel and they can see what the what the final split is so so when we stand up with with our poker chips in hand they can basically count them um, but they don't see the individual transfers that happened in between so the uh, the hands that we play the transfers that we performed um, are all aggregated into these two numbers uh, what what final balance do we end up with and Untangling that is, uh, is incredibly hard, if not impossible. Um, there might be cases where we just played one or two hands and our, the neighboring table also played one hand and the, the amounts just happen to match. And so there is a bit uh, of, uh, uh, that they can infer, but busy channels um, that had, that had their, uh, their funds moved back and forth uh, several times um, they will just not be able to to say anything about that. Um, is it actually better to to name like my full note has a name, and um, is it better to use an anonymous name or can I use my own? I mean, um, so yeah, that that was a bit fun part when we sat down in 2016 to write the specification. The first thing that we decided was, oh yeah, everybody's gonna have a name. Um, where, where they can put in their, their, their fun, their, their emojis and, and their, and their uh, moniker and, uh, and they're all also going to have a color um, because we, we, we thought, oh, that, wouldn't that be cool having a world map glowing with, with, uh, with uh, colored uh, dots and, and everybody could, could say, point to it and say, oh, that, that's mine. Um, but, uh, um, but ultimately it's, it's free for you to, to set your own vanity name. 
uh, we don't verify any of these. So, so every once in a while you see uh, you see the uh, you see a news article about uh, George W. Bush setting up a node because somebody <laughs> somebody put the name in there, um, but they don't realize that it's uh, it's basically uh, it's it's basically self assigned and, and there is no verification. Um, so uh, it's 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 a vanity feature. If you want to be anonymous. It probably isn't a good idea to put uh, to put in your social security number, <laughs> um, uh, and and if you if you want to be sort of on the map and and have the bragging rights of uh, of uh, of being uh, of being an operator of a big node, then yes, mm. by all means, go go ahead and put your put your funny name in there. But, um, yeah, but for regular people, like for privacy reasons, it's not a good idea to to put in your name or uh, yeah your domain or something like that. I guess yeah. It's 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 probably also it probably also doesn't matter uh, because uh, if you are if you are an endpoint that is uh, um, that is only sending or receiving uh, bitcoins, then uh, you probably wouldn't want to announce your channels. And uh, if you don't have announced channels, then you can't announce your uh, your node. Um, that's a, that's an anti-spam measure that that we built in. And so, if if you are a non-routing node, then you can put whatever name in there. Mm. It won't show up anywhere. Um, your peers will actually block that that announcement because they don't know how to uh, what to assign it to. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, and end users will probably not not use any of those features. Yeah, yeah, probably uh, enthusiasts maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I was thinking um, as soon as Taproot uh, will be activated uh, in November, I think there will also be new uh, possibilities for the Lightning Network. Is that right? And which are those? That is correct. Like what? Yeah. What? What? What will it enable uh, in general terms? Yes, so um, there is a couple of things that uh, that are interesting for for Lightning. Um, one is the adoption of a new signature scheme called Schnorr, um, which allows a number of, of optimizations and reduces the, the the size of transactions and hides uh, hides uh, the on chain footprint, so to speak. The other one is uh, is another technology. Uh, or another feature of Taproot, which allows us to to hide basically the structure of uh, of our transactions behind uh, behind what looks like, like a very common uh, uh, transaction requiring a single signature. And the third one is what we as as Lightning developers can build on top of it. Um, so let me start with the last one. Um, the, the last one is, is also a feature that, uh, that builds on top of Schnorr signatures and it, uh, it allows us to make use of the mathematical structure of these signatures um, in a way that allows us to um, create so-called uh, PTLCs, point time lock contracts. Um, what, is, uh, what we have today is hash time lock contracts. Um, and what uh, this this is a feature that uh, that enables us to create end-to-end -end security for our payments. So, if like I said before, if I send one bitcoin to you, I only want to send this one bitcoin to you if you uh, uh, if you actually forward the amount that I told you to forward to the next party. And the way uh, the way this works is basically, hey, I give you this money if you cancel this this mathematical puzzle for me. You don't know how to solve this mathematical puzzle. So you turn around and tell the next person in line, hey, I give you this amount of money if you can solve this mathematical puzzle. And this goes on until you reach the destination. The destination being the one who created this puzzle actually has the solution in hand and then can say, okay, give me my money, here's the solution. Uh, the next guy in line basically Get, uh, loses his money, but he gets the uh, gets the gets the solution to the to the puzzle. He can turn around and says, "Hey, give me my money. Here's the solution." All the way back, back to me, and so I uh, I in the end have sent the money, um, 
and I got the solution for the puzzle. Um, and I can then use that to prove that, yes, indeed, I, I did pay. And everybody in the, in the line uh, was sure that they could get uh, once once they sent out uh, uh, out their uh, their share, they could turn around and and grab the promise on on the incoming side. This has one issue, uh, and namely that the puzzle is always the same along this chain. Um, so if uh, if we have uh, if we have somebody who um, who wants to observe these payments like chain analysis. Um, they might be in multiple places in uh, in this route and say, "Oh, the, I've I've seen this uh, this puzzle before, so this must be the same payment." Um, with PTLCs, what we can is we can change the puzzle slightly over uh, as we as we forward this, and so even if an observer is present multiple times in this forwarding chain, um, they can actually uh, they will not be able to say, "Okay, this is this is the same one." because it looks completely differently from, from what we had before. So this is an, a big in, uh, improvement in, in privacy and it allows us some more advanced features as well um, that I probably shouldn't go too much into detail. Uh, but stuff like sender cancelable payments and stuff like that, where we can, where we can make sure that yes, even if, if something gets stuck, we can still continue performing our payments because we can cancel um, whatever got stuck. Um, the second part is, uh, is how can we hide our on-chain traces better? Um, that is both through Taproot, where we can say, okay, this, the, whatever, however complex our, uh, our spending conditions are, we can hide them behind what looks like a, uh, like a single signature being required. Um, and only when it comes to actually um, to actually making use of these more advanced uh, features, only then we have to reveal stuff, uh, uh, the, the, the details of our agreement. And so if everything goes well, us creating the channel and us settling the channel looks like just any other payment in the network. So um, what I mentioned before is I was able to extract the, uh, um, back in 2019, I was able to extract the hidden part of the network and the public part of the network and basically doing that by, by looking at the, uh, at the traces that channels leave on, on, on the Bitcoin uh, blockchain, um, that will not be possible anymore in future. And so everything will just look like, oh, there is some person transferring some value to, to, uh, to somebody else. Um, they just won't have any idea of whether this is uh, um, this is a channel or not, uh, it will just look like any other transfer. And the final feature that, uh, that we have for Schnorr signatures is that many of our messages in Lightning are signed and sometimes are signed multiple times, uh, especially when we, uh, the, the way we disseminate information about the structure of the network through a, through a mechanism called a gossip mechanism. Um, we exchange messages that are signed by both endpoints of, uh, of, of the channel. And so they can get quite kind, uh, kind of big. So you have to think about every single signature taking 64 bytes. If we have four signatures, then that's 240, uh, 256 bytes just for signatures. And that's without any of the data that we'd actually like to transfer. And Schnorr signatures have this nice feature of actually being able, we can compress them into a single signature. And so we can reduce the amount of data that we have to exchange uh, without impinging on the security of, uh, of the data that we are actually signing. Um, yeah, so I think those are the big features. And there is a whole slew of, of smaller features that, uh, that are also there. And uh, the mailing list is pretty bubbly about, about ideas on what we could build if only we already had activated it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so it's uh, optimization, like data size optimization and also massive privacy yeah. improvements, yeah, which, which, which is great, yeah. Um, talking about privacy improvements, um, what do you see are the hurdles for the adoption of Lightning? I mean, for instance, from the regulatory side, you know, 
Now they want, in the US there is this uh, proposition or however it's called, um, to make everyone a broker who has a routing node. That's at last what I, what I understand. Um, so are you actually developing to make all these regulatory dangers um, invalid? I mean, so that Bitcoin and the Lightning Network will live on forever? I'm definitely not a, rec a regulatory expert, but uh, we, will, we will definitely uh, put all our, uh, of our efforts into making Lightning as private and as scalable and as secure as possible. Um, if that goes against uh, some regulatory proposals, so be it. Um, we, do, we, uh, we are not bound to a single country's regulation. Uh, and uh, if somebody tries to crack down on what they see as, as money laundering or whatever they might whatever excuse they might might use um, then it's their loss because they uh, they are losing a huge and growing industry um, and they might come to regret it or they might uh, might not realize it so um, I'm not too worried about mm. it um, yeah, seems so, because you also before in the beginning, you said um, now we are shrugging that all off, uh, like uh, that a ban might be a danger for Bitcoin or a an attack uh, on, on, on mining or something like that. Yeah. I think I think we've reached a certain size where uh, we're we're forced to be reckoned with and uh, the the fear that there might be a unilateral ban on uh, by by some countries is just not that realistic anymore uh, especially given the ties that we have to existing financial uh, institutions um, the amount of uh, the amount of investment from uh, traditional uh, traditional entities um, it would be basically kneecapping yourself. Yeah, but uh, many politicians don't really know what they're talking about, I guess, and so they also don't know about the implications. And uh, I mean, we've seen it like uh, 20, 30 years ago with cryptography, it was basically the same. Uh, so yeah, let's let's hope and, and great that you build stuff that uh, basically cannot be banned. <laughs> I, I, mean, I mean, regulation and politics is, uh, is a huge random walk. Uh, people make mistakes. Sometimes they learn, sometimes they double down, uh, but ultimately it may take some time, but uh, we end up, we end up uh, with a better system altogether. Mm, so. mm. Um, okay, Kristen, let's talk a little bit about uh, the new uh, product or project by Blockstream. I mean, new for us, not new for you, uh, which is called Greenlight. Um, is Greenlight an option um, that we can establish more nodes around the world more easily? What is it? Yes. Yeah, so um, this this whole project came out of the uh, out of the realization that uh, the technology behind Lightning is still pretty new, and that um, that it is actually quite hard to get into. Not only do you have to learn about Bitcoin, uh, but you now also have to learn about this. The second layer of uh, of abstractions with all the new fancy concepts like channels and balances and capacities, and we as a uh, we as a Bitcoin community have this terrible habit of of shaming people uh, into learning first and only then getting their their hands dirty, and that's off putting to to a lot of people. So um, if if we if we just want to have this tiny group of people that uh, um, that have the time and and the have the ability to dig into the techni technicalities before they can actually they can actually use it and get the upside of uh, of, of this whole effort um, then the community is not going to grow all that much and all of the ambitions of bitcoin becoming a global currency might might be a bit overblown so the the alternative to actually learning all of this is even worse we we are move, uh, We are getting people into uh, buying into custodial wallets, uh, where they aren't holding their keys and where they don't have control over the stuff. But it's nice and easy because everything's handled for them. Uh, of course, with the downside that the service might not uh, might not actually 
have their best interests at, uh, at heart or might be hacked. Um, so what we thought was, uh, uh, was a good uh, road in the middle between self-hosted uh, self wallets, but having to basically read 10,000 pages of, uh, of manual before actually reaping any of the benefits or going for a custodial solution was uh, a path in the middle where uh, we as, uh, as Greenlight, we as Blockstream, being the experts in, in operating Lightning nodes and having all of the knowledge of uh, what uptime requirements are, how to back up uh, Lightning and what, uh, what, what a watchtower is, for example, um, we would be operating the node um, would, uh, uh, and would export an interface that is easy for developers to get started with and on the other side uh, have users hold on to their own keys at any point in time. So the way it works is basically users have a remote control interface to a node that is running on our infrastructure that is set up as securely and as, uh, as highly available as we can. And whenever they perform any action that, that, is, uh, that requires sign off from the Bitcoin private keys, we would then forward this, uh, this, uh, this sign off request to the signer in the hands of the user. And they would, they would then independently verify and sign off on, uh, on these changes um, uh, to make sure that this movement is actually what they intended to do. Um, so this is, this is a platform where we hope to onboard new people that might not have heard about these technologies, might not have the time yet to, to learn, or they just want to dip their toes into using Lightning Network. Um, once they have seen the upside of using Lightning and using Bitcoin, uh, then is the time to actually educate them and give them all of the information that they need to become more self-sovereign participants in the network. And our hope is to eventually offboard them into a self-hosted version where, uh, where they take on more and more responsibility of, of their own infrastructure and become this ideal uh, Lightning user that knows how to, how to run all of this. Um, but basically by putting, by putting the, uh, the benefits in front, of, uh, in front of the large time investment to, to learn, mm -hmm. we, we think this is, a, this is a much better way of educating people. We also call this onboarding to offboard because we, on, we make onboarding easy have uh, exposed them to the educational material that we have at, at hand, and then we encourage them to, to take on more responsibility for them, their families, and their friends, basically. Mm -hmm. So um, you say, not your keys, not your coins, so I get my own seat. Um, yep. But what, what's the device I use? Do I have uh, a green light wallet on my phone or um, how does this work? So there's, there's basically two parts uh, to, to anything that, uh, the, to, to any green light node um, that run on, on the user side. Uh, we have the signer, uh, which for now is just a piece of software that connects to green light, waits for the node to be, to be started and reacts to, uh, to whatever needs to, needs to be signed off and verifies locally with that, that everything is going all right. Um, this could be part of your, uh, of your wallet. This could be part of, uh, of your browser. This could be running on a Raspberry Pi somewhere. Um, and then we have the, uh, the user interfaces, um, which can be combined with a signer or they could be, could be independent. And this could be uh, this could be a browser extension creating an integration with the with the with the browser. So if you want to buy something on Amazon, you basically click a button and the payment is uh, is performed. Or it could be uh, it could be a mobile app on your on your mobile phone, or it could be your tablet or a standalone application somewhere. Or it could be running in a, in a website using uh, using WebAssembly. So uh, you can basically use whatever interface you want to interact with the node, and you can use whatever you want to sign off on uh, on actions performed by the node. Um, the important part here is that 
since this is a uh, this is a single node that you remote into, you can use as many as you want as well. So no longer do you have to split your funds by having one wallet on your phone and uh -huh. then you notice, oh, I wanted to pay these $10, but now I only have like 950. I have to uh, to to call home to send me some on my phone because I had to run multiple nodes. Um, by having a single node that backs all of your uh, all of your wallets, uh, you uh, you forego the additional management uh, that that you'd have to open channels, close channels, rebalance channels. Um, you don't have to split your funds among mo many mo uh, many different wallets, and you have access to all of your funds at, from any of these, uh, of these front ends, um, which is also much, much easier for people to, to grok because, well, try to explain that your phone now has 15% of your funds and 85 are, are somewhere else. Um, so we think it's a much more natural way of thinking about this. Yeah, I understand exactly what you're talking about because whenever I receive a lightning in uh, payment, I have to look into my three or four wallets. Uh, where do I have a channel with enough uh, uh, liquidity or, uh, or incoming liquidity and things like that? But that sounds so comfortable to me that I would not know why I should offboard then again because um, it's this, these features are not working yet on the, 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 the full nodes that are around. So why would I offboard? <laughs> so ultimately we want, to, we want to show you what a, an ideal world could look like uh, by, by onboarding you onto Greenlight. And at the same time, we will give you the, uh, the components that make up Greenlight to reproduce this on your, uh, on your, own, uh, on your own system. So the vast majority of parts that we are building for Greenlight, the, um, the uh, network interface, uh, the plugins that we use to automate some stuff, uh, and, uh, and, and some, uh, some parts of the, uh, of the uh, Sea Lightning projects that, that we customized, we want to eventually op open source them such that you can recreate something that is very, very similar to Greenlight um, with more uptime, for example, uh, on your Raspberry Pi. The way we, we scale out on Greenlight is basically that if you are not, you don't have any of your interfaces open and uh, we, ca we couldn't sign off on any changes anyway, there's no point in us keeping your node running. So after five minutes of inactivity, we'll, we, we will shut it down. It will start up in, uh, in a quarter of a second again once you need it. Um, but uh, during, uh, during the times of, uh, where you're offline, we have to do a lot of additional work for you uh, to, to actually reach out to you and, and, and receive payments, for example. If you host that on your own node, you are not bound to, uh, to, uh, to these limitations. And so we, we will make sure that there are a couple of nice things you get if you, if you actually upgrade your experience mm -hmm. and become mm -hmm. self-sovereign. And this the, this uptime is one of the uh, one of the tidbits that that we want to give you. Um, in addition, by us publishing these parts that the, the components that make up uh, Greenlight, um, we should eventually be able to make sure that whatever interfaces you you have been using before, taking care of your own node, will also continue to work once you once you make it your own. Um, and so there is no, there is literally very little cost in you taking charge of your own node. It boils down to buying a $15 Raspberry Pi and some, some time investment, which is often overlooked. But, um, uh, and, and once you have it, you, you will continue to have the same, the same user experience as you had with Greenlight. Uh, only now you have uh, you have to take care of some additional uh, maintenance like backups and uh, and uh, and uptime mm -hmm. requirements that we that we might have. Okay, interesting. So I guess it will also then be included in in such bundles like the Raspberry Blitz or other uh, full node so software uh, bundles. I certainly hope so. That de that yeah that depends on the maintainers, I guess. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean. Uh, 
we uh, we can uh, we can do uh, we ca uh, we can do nothing more than putting all of these tools out there and making them available uh, and helping people adopt them and 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 explaining how they how they could be reconstituted. Um, but uh, but if uh, if developers do not choose to to adopt them, that's perfectly fine. That's their choice. And speaking of developers, so that's that's sort of the second audience that we have. Uh, for now, it's been very hard for developers of, of applications and, and wallets. Uh, it's been very hard for them to actually get into developing on top of Lightning, um, because the usual way of doing things so far have been to actually bundle the node itself with your software. And all of a sudden you have to be an expert at operating Lightning so uh, nodes as well, because, well, if, if you deploy your, uh, your mobile phone app with an integrated Lightning node, um, then you have to know how to manage channels, how to, how to rebalance. You have to know about backup uh, requirements. You have to know about, uh, about uptime uh, requirements. And, and all of these have prevented a lot of uh, developers that might otherwise contribute to the Lightning ecosystem uh, from actually participating and helping us make it more accessible to users. And our hope is by us taking care of what we do best, managing nodes, uh, we can free these app developers to do what they do best, um, optimizing user experience, optimizing interfaces, and making things more accessible. So is it uh, then also possible, I guess one would have an API then to also include like online payments from online shops and things like that. Or will this not be a part of Greenlight? Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, what, uh, what you basically get right now is, uh, is you get a, a stock C Lightning node that is there on demand whenever you need it. Uh, you can integrate with it however you want. Uh, if, uh, like I said, if, if you want to create a, a browser extension that basically grabs these, uh, uh, these payment requests from Amazon or whatever, and, and presents you with an interface where you can s sign off on, on the, the transfer being done, um, that's, that's perfectly possible. Uh, we, can, we can replicate the current uh, user experience of scanning QR codes. Uh, we, have, we have some people working on NC type payments where you tap your phone onto, on, onto a point of sale. Um, so, uh, so all of these, uh, all of these user experiences are definitely possible. Um, we just need people to actually implement them and, and uh, try them out and see what works and what sticks. Mm -hmm. Great. And um, so are the, I mean, I've read that Sphinx Chat and Lastbit uh, Striga are your first partners. Are those kind of the partners or developers that you said before that then can or should build on top of Lightning? Yes. Uh, so we announced Greenlight a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's, uh, it's a, currently it's a closed beta, um, simply because we, we want to slowly scale up and, uh, and, uh, fix any issues that we might encounter before onboarding the next cohort of people. Um, and so we, we go this very deliberate and maybe slow, uh, but incremental rollout where, where we try to. Uh, where we try to improve as we go and test out while, uh, while we go. So people, once they get, uh, get onto it, uh, have the best experience they can. Um, last bit uh, and, uh, and Sphinx Chat uh, were, uh, were two very early contacts that we had. Um, they have very, uh, very different use cases. Sphinx Chat obviously being podcast streaming and, and sort of peer-to-peer uh, -peer payments. Um, and, and last bit, ba uh, basically being an on uh, online wallet um, that runs, runs in a browser, um, we thought they represented a nice spectrum of, of possible integrations. Um, and so we chose to basically announce with them uh, because they show, they show the potential of what we can do, the breadth of the, uh, of the, of the things that we can do. Um, we are currently working with a number of other teams uh, to, to bring more diverse use cases into the fold and we will announce them as, uh, uh, as, we, uh, as we develop them and as we, as we onboard them. Um, 
but uh, as currently we, we, we have we have way more interested parties than we have actually capacity to assist them uh, in, mm. in developing their apps. And so uh, it's, uh, it's, been, it's been a bit frustrating to have to turn so many people away, but um, we, we promise that, that eventually this, mm -hmm. this will all, all be public and, uh, and everybody will get their turn at, uh, at trying to play with it. Uh, but we want to make this a, a, a successful uh, deployment where where everybody has the best time they could have. Mm, great, sounds great, and and very promising. And uh, last question to 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 Greenlight, what's the trust model behind it? Because you said I get my keys, but then it's uh, in between custodial and non-custodial. So what 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 might happen in the worst case? So. Uh, you don't get your keys. Uh, you generate them on your devices. We never see them at all. Oh, uh, I tried Striga and uh, I immediately saw my seat and um, had to write it down. I mean, I couldn't proceed from there because it was too complicated, yes. but yeah. Uh, so, so Striga is a bit of a special case. Uh, they basically run the signer on their server, um, but we as Greenlight don't see it. Mm -hmm. um, they, they chose to do it this way because it, uh, it is a testnet wallet. Uh, we would never ever do that for a mainnet wallet. Um, and it, uh, the signer software uh, doesn't currently run in, in a browser. Um, so mm -hmm. they, had, they had to sort of find the middle ground there. Um, but we are working on, on the signer being available on, uh, in the browser itself as well. And, and so, uh, so once that is complete, then, uh, then you will, we, no party will ever see your keys other than, uh, other than yourself. Um, so our model currently is you generate the, uh, the seed, uh, the, the key uh, on your side. We never see it. Uh, you register with this key on your server. Uh, all we see is a public node. Um, one, uh, when you connect to the uh, to your uh, to your node, whenever you send a command to the node, it is being signed by uh, by one of the certificates that um, that you yourself generated and are uh, are authenticated, and they authorize this action. And this action. Uh, is then passed down to the signer, and the signer can say, "Okay, yes, this is this is signed by Anita's iPad. Um, this is a device that was uh, that was allowed that is allowed to perform this action, and only then will it look. Okay, what's the effect of this action onto my node, and is this plausible that I am signing?" A, uh, a withdrawal transaction, for example, if Anita, uh, Anita's iPad instructed me to withdraw uh, uh, some, some funds on-chain. If yes, then I will sign it. If not, I will just reject this, uh, the signature request and the note can, uh, uh, can uh, basically is, is get, going to get killed. Um, so we as, uh, uh, we as operators cannot initiate any, anything that touches your funds. Um, a hacker that could take over our infrastructure can never, uh, can never initiate anything like withdrawing. And, uh, and, we, uh, and all we do see is uh, some information about your channels. And we are actively working on reducing that as well. Um, so we're thinking about encrypting invoices such that we as operators can't see them anymore. Um, we are thinking about implementing something we call oblivious send, where, uh, where we don't even see where a payment is going uh, to anymore because all of, the, uh, all of the instructions to perform the payment are, uh, are managed and steered by your phone, for example. And uh, we, have, we have loads of, uh, of cool ideas on how to improve the security and privacy here, um, some of which are implemented, some of which aren't just yet. Um, but I think you'll, you'll, find, you'll find the trade-offs that we, that we offer, because you, you will always have the choice of what, what to do, um, are quite attractive. 
Okay, great. But, but we, we won't quite get to a self-managed mm. node, but uh, that's that's where we want to push you to. So Exactly, that was not the goal. So yeah, and I think these bridge technologies are very important. It's like a little bit, it reminds me a little bit about uh, Strike, which is basically also uh, bridging uh, the gap, the technology, technology gap between uh, traditional banking and, and lightning and traditional banking. But um, many people criticize it because of KYC and whatever, but I think it's a, a demonstration um, what, what is possible, yeah. Absolutely, it's, it's all about enabling a movement between, between different system, enabling compatibility between these systems and uh, and sure at some points we have to take trade-offs um, but uh, but we can always encourage people to take charge of their own their own uh, privacy and their own security and and i think that should be the goal like i said onboarding to offboard here mm, exactly i mean it's uh, one of the attacks on bitcoin all the time by i mean your favorite altcoin here um any altcoin is saying we are better than bitcoin because we are faster and cheaper and whatever but i think there are lots of um, downsides or uh, other trade-offs they have then and most people don't understand them um i mean from your research side or academic side why did you choose to work in Bitcoin and why don't you work on Ethereum or Cardano or whatever? Um, probably two simple reasons. Uh, Bitcoin is what I grew up with and I hate hype. Um, so Bitcoin is basically what I got started with. Bitcoin is the, the system that I see the most potential with because of the people that are involved. And uh, these, the, the, the engineers and the researchers working on, on Bitcoin are all very down to earth. They don't, they don't tend to, to promise too much. They are, they set very realistic goals usually. And, uh, that's, that's an attitude that I very much like, uh, in a system. And, uh, it, it basically at some point is that the constraints that Bitcoin imposes on you are a challenge. Yes. Um, but it's a challenge to make things interesting. And I think that that is something that other altcoins haven't quite realized just yet is that, um, yes, Ethereum might be more flexible. There might be Cardano, which, which offers more expressiveness in their, in their contracts. But uh, all of the very interesting use cases we've found so far is that if you put in a bit more work, we can actually make them work on Bitcoin itself. There is absolutely no need for you to uh, to create a completely new network and a completely new token just to get these features. Um, usually it is that uh, by investing the extra time to port these, uh, these things back onto Bitcoin, by uh, working around the limitations that Bitcoin has, uh, we can uh, we can end up with a system that is much 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 more performant and much more scalable than whatever whatever altcoins are are promising. Uh, trying not to swear here, um, and uh, and this flexi this apparent flexibility that that uh, altcoins usually promise to you and the, the, the more expressive contract language and whatever. They come at a huge cost, and that cost is uh, is basically it's it's externalized onto the nodes running the uh, running the uh, running the the network itself. Uh, with our very conservative approach in in Bitcoin, we are enabling everybody to run uh, almost everybody to run a Bitcoin node nowadays. And uh, by jumping through a couple of extra hoops, we can still get all of these features. And so I, I see the limitations or the apparent limitations that Bitcoin might have as much more a forcing function uh, to, for developers and engineers to come up with a more uh, with a more clever solution that in the end is also more performant. And so I, I usually consider altcoins to be an excellent test net for Bitcoin and uh, a test bed where they can go crazy and just they, ju they can uh, invent whatever use case they want. 
if it makes sense and if it sees adoption, we will put in the extra hours and make it work on Bitcoin. So Yeah, I mean, it's just sad to see that many people lose their money betting on those altcoins uh, bec just because they don't understand the implications and they are following the marketing language, you know. Um, and I think for me, one of the elementary reasons why I think Bitcoin, I mean, next to many reasons is the one that, that there's no leader and uh, we don't know who Satoshi Nakamoto is or was and that's good. Um, and all those other people like, yeah, these are for me like the, the, the single point of failure in a way. Yeah, it's, 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 really, it's really kind of sad that, uh, that this uh, idolization of, of certain people is, uh, is such a huge driver both for, uh, for uh, people cheering, but also mm -hmm. for, uh, for financial support. Um, I, I hope people will eventually learn to, to do their own research and, and basically not trust whatever other people say. Um, but uh, I might have to rethink that, uh, that desire at some point. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so thank you very much, Christian. Um, Last question, um, what is your vision for Bitcoin and Lightning in the next, let's say, five years? I guess you have an opinion on that. Uh, I'm really bad with predictions. Like I said, <laughs> I, I sold yeah. 100 Bitcoins for five dollars. <laughs> um, my hope, however, is that uh, that we will we will see continued growth, um, incremental, maybe a bit slow growth as well. Um, we we definitely don't need a, a hype cycle that uh, that pulls in loads of people that then get disillusioned. Uh, I'd like to see I, I'd like to see incremental and and sustainable growth, and uh, and us basically slowly improving and making things more accessible so that uh, so that we can reach more and more people who might uh, who might also need this uh, this network. They just don't know it yet, or they just don't have the tools. At, the, uh, at this time, or they might not have the time to invest to, to actually learn about this stuff yet. And so I, I think it's, it's going to be sometimes frustrating because it's a bit slow, um, but slow is uh, sustainable. So um, that's my hope. Mm, exactly. Yeah. And thank you for building all this inclusive technology that is going to enable people all over the world to use uh, this neutral financial network because, and it's not only a financial network, but that's another podcast episode. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. Uh, where can people find and follow your work? Uh, so I'm uh, uh, Snyke on Twitter, S-N-Y-K-E and uh, see Decker almost everywhere else, uh, GitHub, uh, mostly GitHub. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, IRC, the OG of communication protocols. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, so thank so, you so much for having me. Thank you very much too. Thanks for joining everybody. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and please subscribe to the Anita Po Show at anita.link slash subscribe. Thanks, bye-bye.